Should your pastor preach politics from the pulpit? Let's look at this today. This is part two. Let's look at this today from Jesus' perspective, and let's go bold. I'm Scott Patton. Thank you all for joining us today for the Go Bold Podcast. Please consider hitting that like, subscribe, and share button on our YouTube channel. Also, we'd appreciate it if you would like and follow our Facebook page at the Go Bold Network. And finally, check out our website at the goboldnetwork.net. That is the goboldnetwork.net. You know, the greatest strategic danger to the lost are silent and timid Christians. We're going to call out the persecution and deceptions of Christians in all forms. And we will be bold and we're going to stand up for King Jesus against the cancel and the Marxist culture as we see it today. Now, to our top story. Now, should your pastor preach politics from the pulpit? This is our second in our series that we're doing on uh, pulpit in the politics or politics in the pulpit, however you look at it. And this is our mini-series. And the last time we looked at an often uh, and uh, controversial and confusing set of scriptures in Romans 13, 1 through 7, and how many secularist politicians and, and elite liberal Christians like to use to beat people into submission to succumb to their political beliefs. And a lot of times people would use what Paul wrote in Romans 13, and we, we discussed that, and, and we also looked at, we examined this from an Old Testament perspective. But today, we're going to analyze this through the, the greatest preacher of all time, and that's Jesus Christ. And I want us to start with this premise. I want to start with this premise up front. First, Jesus was, I just want everybody to remember this before we even get into this, this whole idea, because what happens a lot of times is people will say, well, Jesus never talked about it, any politics or any of that nonsense in the pulpit. Okay. I want you to understand this. I want you to understand this premise. First, Jesus was killed by Roman soldiers. He was sentenced to death by none other than Pontius Pilate. Oh, yeah, he wasn't religious leader. He was the, the, he was the governor. He was a Roman governor. So this whole idea that Jesus never spoke out against the politics of the day or the government, when it violated God's law, that is absolute nonsense, and it's foolish to believe that he didn't do it otherwise. Jesus spoke truth to power in the pulpit especially when it was a violation of God's law. Now, he didn't, like, advocate for a particular politician. He didn't advocate for tax laws or, or different things like that, not new taxes, not new roads, or the, he, didn't, he, didn't, he didn't fight against, he wasn't an antagonist against daily governance. No. But issues that affected his flock as a shepherd, I'm going to tell you, Jesus spoke out about, and he spoke out loud and clear. Now, I want you guys to remember this other premise right now. Jesus Christ was not crucified for what he did. He was crucified for what he said. Can I get an amen in the comment section on that one? Jesus, I want you guys to remember, was a preaching machine. I can't wait to get up in heaven someday and just watch those sermons. Man, they were, I bet they were just, and, and see, here's, here's, here's the problem. We, we, we tend to think that Jesus uh, was this little meek and mild man or kumbaya popular pants preacher in the pulpit with fog on a stage and popcorn machines. No, uh-uh. That wasn't Jesus. Man, he was a preaching machine. And this is especially true when, when he saw, when he saw uh, uh, things that violated God's law or things that were happening to his sheep as a shepherd. Now, a lot of times people will think that um, uh, that that it was just the religious leaders. But here's what I want you to understand and during this time. A lot of times in this time period, you had the government uh, would collude with religious leaders. And when Jesus saw that was a hindrance to the gospel, I'm going to tell you guys, he would challenge this. And he and he would he would he would challenge this on all fronts. Now. I want you to look at a set of scriptures that I've got for you here today in Matthew chapter 23. Now, when you get a, get a chance, I, I would re highly encourage you 
to go over this, uh, this, this scripture uh, and read it in its entirety and pray over it. We talked about this in our men's Bible study the other day. But I'm going to read God's word, and what you see on the screen, Matthew 23, verses 27 and 28. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, you hypocrites, for you're like a whitewashed tombs, which on the outside appear beautiful, but on the inside they're full of dead men's bones and uncleanliness. You two outwardly appear righteous to people, but inwardly you are full of hypocrisy and lawlessness. Yeah, these are the words of Jesus Christ. Now, I want you guys to understand this. This is where the, a lot of the confusion, I believe, comes in. The Pharisees were an extension of the Roman government. Do you hear what I said? They just weren't these, 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 these off-to-the-side religious people. They were extensions of the Roman government. Okay. You know, I, I read on a blog post, I believe it was a place called Renew.org. They had a, a really good analysis of this. Now, where you saw this, at the, at the time, this was significant for Jesus' time because he directed his language at the Pharisees in front of crowds. You saw that in Matthew. If you want to look back on this, you can see this in Matthew uh, uh, verse 23.1. But he also did this out of uh, uh, to his to on behalf of his people who might become under their destructive influence. And that's exactly where I think we're called as preachers today. You see, he is speaking up for the common people whose shoulders the Pharisees had placed a heavy, heavy burden on, these cumbersome loads, while being unwilling to lift a finger to move them. You saw what Jesus said in verse 4, but it's, it, it seems evident that Jesus' public hypocrisy exposing speech was motivated by love for the people he wanted to save. He wasn't trying to be mean to the Pharisees, but he knew that their their motives were corrupt, and, and, and he knew that their motives were a hindrance to the gospel from keeping his, his children into the, the kingdom of God. As much as motivated, it, it was more motivated by a desire to, to save uh, the lost than to poke at the Pharisees. When you look further in, 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 in Matthew 23, Jesus is going to say in, in the closing part of the sermon, yes, he was preaching, reveals a couple of things. It was harsh rhetoric, and it was a diet. I mean, at one point he was calling the Pharisees these, these vipers and these hypocrites, and, oh, man, he was just he was tearing them up. But what he was directed at was really because he knew that these same people with on behalf of the Roman government, yes, because they were working for them. Don't you forget that. That's what the Pharisees were doing. They were part of this whole deal. He knew that this was going to be future persecutions. He knew this was going to be current persecutions. He knew about his death, and he knew exactly how he was going to die. But it was also because his people, I want you to look there at verse 34, Matthew 23, 34. Therefore, behold, I am sending you prophets and wise men and scribes. Some of them you will kill and crucify. Some of them you will flog in your synagogues and persecute from city to city. Let that sink in. You see, I'm going to tell you something, guys. Jesus was a master at calling out persecution and deception from the pulpit. Now, pastors, I'm just going to tell you, and to me included, we can learn a lot from Jesus preaching and how he shepherds the flock because this is what we're not doing right now. When we're seeing things that are wrong in God's law in our society today, when we see these things that are wrong, I'm not saying do anything violent. I'm not saying break the law. But I am saying when you're in the pulpit, you need to have the guts to speak about it. And that's my problem today with many pastors that we see uh, that trying to be cool, they're trying to look cool, they try to, to be ever popular, and a lot of times they'll say the right things. I don't have a problem with what they're saying. But you know what I have a problem with? I have a problem with what they're not saying. They don't want to address anything that's somewhat controversial. Now, I want to just address something right quick. And that is, this is confusing to a lot of people. And people will say that, 
that Jesus just spoke out against the Pharisees and not the government. Now, biblical scholar and theologian Walter, I, I want to say his name right, Brug, Brug, Brugman, says this, and he has extensive knowledge. He, the guy has, he has two PhDs, a uh, pretty smart guy, and he has extensive knowledge of biblical history there in this time and Scripture. But he, he speaks about this in his book, Speaking Truth to Power. And I want to I want to use some quotes that he has here. Early in the gospel tradition, the power elites in Jesus' society, who were the Pharisees, they were colluding with the Roman Empire. And that's, that's not just a theory, guys. That's a fact. They were. They were recognized. And they recognized, along with the Roman Empire, they recognized Jesus Christ as a threat. And they, very early on, when they saw his ministry uh, spreading, they conspired to kill him very early on. The Pharisees and the Sadducees. Hey, you know how you can remember the Sadducees. Sad to see you. Just remember that. Sad to see you. You always remember the Sadducees. They were an extension of the Roman government. They were in. They were paid off. They were corrupt. They were like, hey, you want a new uh, synagogue? Okay. And the Roman government would build them. They would build them roads. Uh, they would give, give them money. They paid them off. They made their families comfortable. They gave them protection. You see, that's how they do. That's how many Marxists uh, do today to this world. That's how many government, that's how the government operates. All right? And I think, uh, and see, see, here's, here's the thing. See, here's the thing. When Jesus started presenting these narratives of the freedom of the gospel and, and, and the gospel is freedom and, and our love for Jesus Christ, and this was a different narrative, and it was a huge, huge threat to the established order of the Roman Empire. Once you look at that picture there, all the Roman politicians, oh, here's what I believe, guys. I believe the Roman authorities and the politicians perceived Jesus as a clear and present danger. And I, exactly how, if you really look at the Bible and you look at the inspired word of the Holy Spirit, this is how the gospel writers present this. There's a passage in the Gospel of Luke that we don't have time to cover here today that summarizes this uh, by saying, you know, uh, they already, the leadership tried to find ways to kill Jesus because, but, but they, they, they really didn't want to. You saw how, remember him, Pontius Pilate, washed his hands of this because here's the problem. People were so mesmerized at, by Jesus' preaching. They were spellbound by his preaching, what God's Word said. That's what the Bible says. Jesus became the reference point for much of the hostility and the resistance to the power of the empire because he refused to accommodate. He told another story of the reality that the empire was not the empire. Jesus was preaching that the empire was God's kingdom. That's the only empire. Yes, indeed. Yes, indeed. That's the only empire. And I'll tell you someday, the empire indeed is going to strike back. When Jesus comes back to the earth on a white horse. So, yes, this example of Jesus speaking out against a tyrannical government from the pulpit, that's what he did. Now, Jesus is not telling us to break the law or not to pay your taxes or not to be your good citizens or not to be a good witness. He's not telling you to, to be a jerk for Jesus. No, he never says that. Never what he said in Matthew 23, 22, I believe. Render Caesar's what is Caesar's, and render God what is God's. What Jesus is showing is when the government or political leaders persecute, deceive, harm people, we as pastors, we as shepherds of his people must have the courage to speak out from the pulpit. And I'm going to tell you something, Christians. You need to have the courage to do that too. You do it for your families, for your children, for your households, dads. When God's, when these laws violate God's laws, many times pastors, yeah, we're not going to win friends, and we might even lose some people in our church. But this is what God's called us to do. I want you to look at that, that picture there in front of you. <laughs> that is John the Baptist. I don't know if he looked, actually looked like that, but biblical descriptions uh, uh, tell us that he did. <laughs> 
Now, probably one of the most visible preachers ever to say this, I would say, uh, vivid preachers to ever say his convicted mind <laughs> was John the Baptist. Man, I'll tell you what, Southern Baptist elites would have fun with him today. You talk about a, but they would they would have him uh, pinged as a fundamentalist. They would be throwing rocks at him from every which way. But John was indeed one of the most courageous pastors in history. Can you imagine John the Baptist with a couple of, of expressos down him? Oh, good grief. Can you imagine that? If they only would have had the expresso machine when John was preaching. Oh, my goodness. Did John the Baptist, did he violate this whole idea of Romans 13? Principle of submission to authority when he publicly scolded King Herod for his infidelity. Oh, but but I don't like my preacher preaching against politics in the pulpit. Really? John was indeed one of the most outspoken pastors ever. His passion and his courage was unmatched. Man, I'll tell you what, I love John the Baptist, but I'll tell you who loved John the Baptist more. That was Jesus. Jesus loved John the Baptist. Remember what Jesus said in Matthew 11, 11? I want you to look at it on the screen. Truly, I tell you, among those born of women, there is risen anyone greater than John the Baptist. Yet, whoever is least in the kingdom of heaven is greater than he. Now, I could hear the crying now. I could hear the crying uh, that and the complaining about John. If you had a modern-day John the Baptist here <laughs> in the world today on the stage yeah i could hear i could i could i could see it right now but here's the thing jesus loved john the baptist but i want to focus on something that jesus said that's often overlooked whoever is the least of the kingdom of heaven is greater than he i believe and and i think other people uh have seen this before too is is the kingdom of heaven is greater than he jesus is referring to um uh, the Holy Spirit of God, and before you, you know, before you know this, this uh, John the Baptist was here on the earth preaching before Pentecost, before the Holy Spirit of God came down and descended upon all His people. What, what Jesus is saying here, uh, you and the least in the kingdom right now can have the conviction of John the Baptist because you now have the power of the Holy Spirit, and the power of the Holy Spirit gives you conviction. It gives you the courage. Yes to speak out against tyranny and justice. Now, how do you square that? How do you square that, again, with Romans 13? I want to go back to Romans 13, and we did that in the previous podcast. Let's look at that here from a theological perspective. And I'm going to remind you what is said in God's Word here, that everyone be subject to the governing authorities, for there is no authority except which God has established. The authorities that exist have been established by God. Yes, that same, same uh, one, the Apostle Paul. Yes, Paul is saying that the authority is with God, the kingdom of God, period. Yes, remember, Jesus did not physically harm or ever call for any violence, especially even when he was speaking out against the Pharisees or the Sadducees. Paul never did either. Paul would always submit to him after they would throw him in jail. He was always a, a kind and, and, and polite, but he would call things out. He wasn't, he wasn't violating, you know, and even though he wrote those words, but he refused to obey those authorities who demanded that he abandon his ministry work. In fact, you guys know, Paul spent much of the time, he spent more time in jail than he did out of jail. He spent more of that time in jail than he did out of jail. And here's what I'll tell you. Here's what I'll tell you. All these have, remember that every apostle of Christ except John was killed by hostile and civil authorities opposed to their endeavors. Christians throughout the church history were imprisoned, tortured, or killed by civil authorities, all stripes for refusing to submit to their various laws and prohibitions. Did all these Christian martyrs violate God's principle of submission to authority? Ask yourself that question. 
So even the prophets, the apostles, the writers of the Bible, including the writers of Romans chapter 13, understood that human authority, even civil authority, is limited. Yes, indeed, it is. Paul, the same person that would write, inspired by the Holy Spirit of God, the words in Romans 13, would later be beheaded by the government for not denouncing Jesus Christ. So to all the disciples of Jesus and the pulpit, it's not a political convention nor a place to endorse candidates or political parties. No, that's not what I'm saying, and you know that's not what I'm saying. But when the politics and the government start affecting the gospel of Jesus, you have an obligation, a biblical obligation to preach about it. You must use discernment. You must use the Bible as your foundation and not be guided by your emotions. And you also must be guided by the Holy Spirit of God. And that is how we go bold today. Join us on our next episode as we continue our series, The Pulpit and Politics, Part 3. And what I'm going to do next time is show you a view from the 21st century, some good examples and some bad examples. God bless you and go bold. <laughs>